Hi, good afternoon and welcome to the Coffee and Catch Up um, with Julie and myself. I'm Alison Smith. I'm one of the Cardiomopathy um, UK um, trustees and I'm really pleased to be joining you all this lunch. Hi there, I'm Julie Rees. Um, I run the Cheshire and Merseyside support group for Cardiomyopathy UK and I have a daughter who uh, was born with dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about my family, so you can see us all there on holiday. Probably a bit of a distant dream to many of us this year, having a holiday. Um, so my connection to the charity is my husband has um, Oakham, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Martin and I started his journey in the early 90s. Um, we were newly engaged, looking to buy a house. He was working at the time as a scaffolder. Um, his actual job at the time was um, on the fire shelves of um, Canary Wharf, so that really tall building, if anyone doesn't know it in London, um, putting in lots of hours. Um, the work at the time was very lucrative as um, the Docklands was all appearing. Um, but in passing, he mentioned that he was getting palpitations and being the worrier that I am, I suggested that he got that looked at, um, which he did quite promptly. And as soon as he mentioned his dad had had a sudden death at 30, he was whisked straight through and given a diagnosis really quickly, um, which I know isn't the case for everybody. Um, but we, consequently, because of that, he had to give up scaffolding and became unemployed. Um, he was getting wonderful care at Guy's Hospital in London, um, but it wasn't a specific clinic. Um, he was only in his mid-20s and felt it was more of an elderly clinic for general heart failure. So although he was getting good care, it wasn't very specific in answering his questions. Um, and then through college work, I was given a second-hand computer. Um, we're going back now to broadband days when you used to have to dial up, um, you know, not be using the telephone to use the computer and um, started to, you know, look at what Hokum was and start reading all those awful stories, um, facts that, you know, life would be shorter, maybe heart transplants, and just all things that I really didn't, really didn't expect. Um, but on the plus side of it, I also found what was CMA at the time. Um, they had a helpline and were obviously on the internet at that point. And with them, um, and the advice of the helpline, they suggested that we saw Professor McKenna at St George's in London. Um, so again, we moved across and um, continued our care with them. Um, and then we were encouraged to look at our family tree. Um, and that's when all the history just started to really fall into place. So as I said, Martin's father had died at 30. There was another uncle who died as a child of um, a they just didn't know the death. Well, they said he fell off his bike, but there was all very strange stories in the family. Um, we found cousins across the globe that had had sudden deaths. And so gradually our family tree was starting to piece together um, that it wasn't just us. Um, when the boys came along, we um, were recommended to go under the care of Great Ormond Street for our screening. So again, saw Professor McKenna with his colleague, Professor Dean Field at Great Ormond Street with annual screening for both the boys up until... They were 18, um, and now all three of them are seen at Bart's. Um, so Martin now has an ICD fitted. You see, he's actually his third one um, and doing really, really well. Um, neither of the boys have showed any um, heart muscle thickening with um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, although we had the gene identified in the family last year, so we've been waiting ages to have that done um, and our youngest son has got the actual gene so he'll obviously continue um, thorough monitoring. Julie could I have my next slide please? Yep. It's a team effort here. <laughs> yep. Thank you. So this is Martin um, last week at the Chatham 10k. Um, so like many of us our journeys you know up and down um, so obviously I've already said he had to change his career um, he's faced long periods of unemployment. He was made redundant from another job. And then because he was on the waiting list to have an ICD, he would then have trouble getting any employment because people didn't want to take him on. Um, he had to give up playing Saturday football, um, something that he really enjoyed. Um, he was quite devastated at that. Um, it was his way of just being one of the lads, keeping him fit, and he loved it. Um, but when he spoke to his consultant, they asked, was he pushing himself, you know, when he's playing? And he agreed he did. After all, you don't play football to lose. You're one of the team and he wanted to win. So it was at that point they had the discussion, quite an honest one, that 
maybe pushing yourself playing football wasn't the right thing to do, um, which he found very hard. Um, but he took up running, um, never run in his life, um, did you know a good running plan, built himself up, and now does regular 10Ks. Um, and I'm just the official bag carrier now watching him at the races. Um, can be a little bit worrying when I'm expecting him in and he's not in, but, you know, he doesn't ever push himself. So he knows how to manage it um, and does really well. Um, so, again, it's not competitive for him. It's just about looking after his physical and mental health. My next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I just thought I'd share some slides just of, as what we've been doing as a family. Um, so we don't go to a local support group. Um, we have tried one once um, and Martin didn't feel it was really for him. Um, he doesn't like um, Hokum to defy him. And when people start talking about their tablets and that, he just tends to switch off. He doesn't totally bury his head in the sand, but he's quite happy for me to go and find all the information and talk to the helplines and if ever we need anything answered. Um, and that's, that's just how we deal with it. Um, but we do do fundraising as a family. We find that, you know, really enjoyable. Um, I've got a few different pictures on there. So most recently, my parents had their 50th wedding anniversary and in lieu um, of gifts that they really didn't need or more plants in the garden that they really didn't need, they just asked for donations. Um, we've had a ladies' night um, when my dad um, was in the lodge. And again, raffle prizes and things like that. And then last year, we had a lovely evening of over 100 people um, come together to have a... Well, we had a night at the movies. I won a raffle prize um, of over 100 people at a hotel. All the food was being paid for. The hotel were giving us the premises. Um, we just had to get bombs on seats and sell tickets, um, which we did. Um, and we celebrated the 30th anniversary of cardiomyopathy and the 50th anniversary of Parkinson's UK and raised um, just over £5,000 for the two charities and they had a really good night. So um, that's how we support the charity. Um, I love being part of the community. Um, I particularly find the Facebook group really useful. That fits with my life. Um, but yeah, so that's me. So over to Julie. Thanks, Alison. That was really interesting to... To hear, I mean, obviously, because we've had Jenny with the condition uh, from a baby, it's 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 it, the, the problems and the and the you know the uh, experience is is different, isn't it? Because she's never known anything different. Whereas I think for your husband to suddenly find he's got this condition, and you know, you have all these plans for your life, and uh, yeah, just totally different uh, slant on on living with the condition. So. Thanks for sharing the story. So should I, um, I'll, I'll kick off with my story and then maybe we'll, we'll do some questions at the end. Okay, so yep. the slide you're seeing now is, is my family. We have four daughters, my husband, Mark and I. Um, yeah, we just didn't get the boy. <laughs> We've just got all girls. Jenny is our second daughter. She's actually the, the girl on the right-hand side that you can see there. Um, she uh, was born normal delivery she was a little bit blue when she came out and so the uh, they put her in an incubator for a while but we we took home a normal baby as far as we were aware and it wasn't until she was about six weeks old that she developed quite a rattly chest so we took her to the gp and subsequently ended up in alder hay which is our local children's hospital and discovered that she had fluid on her lungs and it was actually caused by a leaky valve because her heart was too big and had stretched the, the valve. So we, we didn't actually hear the word cardiomyopathy until she was about six. Um, we were just told at that point she would grow into her heart. Her heart was too big for her, but eventually it would be the right size as she grew, which, you know, when you, when you know what you know now is crazy, isn't it? But uh, for about six years, she was just on Captopril. We used to have to crush it between two spoons and put some of her baby milk on it um, to get that down when she was tiny. Um, and she was just a normal child. Um, if we just click on to the next slide, you can see as she grew up, you would never know there was anything anything wrong at all. She was happy, um, you know, not, not poorly at all until... Uh, she was actually a teenager, but um, she would get really, really tired. That's the only thing. And we would find her 
um, in all sorts of, even just show you the next slide, they, uh, all sorts of strange positions. This one here, she'd just fallen asleep over the arm of the chair. Um, and that's how we found her. Um, and that was the only thing, really. I mean, she did, gosh, she did swimming, she did trampolining, you know, netball, um, all sorts of things as she grew up. Um, but when she was six, uh, we actually had a, a change of consultant at Alder Hay. Uh, her consultant retired. And we had uh, two different cardiologists, Dr. Peart and Dr. Evans-Jones. And at our first appointment with them, I just casually said, well, at what age will a heart be the right size? You know, because that's how I sort of had it in my head what would happen. And they just kind of looked at me like I was off another planet and, and very gently explained that this was a condition that wasn't going to go away. She would be on medication for life. And really the shock of that, um, I had my mum with me at the time and she took Jenny out into the... Um, uh, the the waiting room and I had to ask for a further appointment for just my husband and I to go and ask all the questions because this was this was massive to us uh, so that day is kind of etched in my memory um, so after that obviously we wanted to kind of wrap her in cotton wool really you know and not let, allow her to do lots of things that she she loved doing but Jenny being Jenny, she fought us every step of the way. She wanted to run cross country at school and play netball. And uh, when she was around 14, actually, she, she actually started collapsing at school. This is at high school now. And obviously the school knew about her heart condition at that point. So they would ring an ambulance and she would get, you know, I had an older daughter who was at the same school and I'd get this call, mum, Jenny's gone off in, in an ambulance. So I'd race to the hospital and basically they had to stop her running because, you know, it, was, it wasn't doing her any good. And she used to beg the PE teacher, I remember every PE lesson, the PE teacher would say, she'd say, oh, please, miss, go on, I love running, you know, and she'd say, Jenny, you're going to lose me my job. Yeah, so, so poor PE teacher, I remember. But then, obviously, we discovered at that point that she had a left bundle branch block, and that's when there's a bit of an electrical delay on the left-hand side. So instead of her heart uh, beating in sync, it was actually wobbling a little bit, so she wasn't getting that good sort of whoosh of blood as it contracted. So they tried her on, they then started her on what was brand new at the time, a beta blocker, uh, and she actually had to go into Alder Hay to be monitored while they gradually increased the dose over a few days um but this was sort of i don't know 14 years of age when she was on a ward with tiny babies you know in, in cots um so that that helped um but then at 16 her ejection fraction which had always been around 28 dropped to 19 so after an exercise tolerance test um dr p informed us that in his experience when the heart function starts to decline, as Jenny's had, it tends to drop quite quickly and we could be looking at a heart transplant situation before too long. So, again, that was another kind of real shock that, you know, because when you look looked at her, she didn't actually look that poorly. Um, so, at 16, she was transferred over to the adult care at Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital and she was put under the care of Archie Rao, who has been an amazing, an amazing doctor. And she fitted Jenny with a pacemaker that had a third wire with the um, ability to sink that bottom chamber of our heart so that the, the electrical, to, to address the electrical delay. Um, uh, so at, at the time, this was 16, she was right in the middle of her GCSEs, of course, you know, bad timing all round. But, uh, but she got through it uh, and we were, we were in despair of what, what the future would hold. But um, Jenny has always been very, um, very good at just getting on with, with things. Um, she actually did get a full set of A's and B's in her GCSE. So uh, she did really well. Um, so it was about around this time that we discovered what was then the Cardiomyopathy Association. Um, and attended many of the information days they had. Uh, one particular one was in Manchester's in Manchester, and the speakers we heard really helped us understand what the condition was. 
and we actually brought home a CD-ROM, you know, like a video for the family to watch, which helped them too. But just being in a room full of people that sort of understood the condition and had the same condition was a real turning point for both us and for Jenny at that age. And she no longer felt alone um, and she could access up-to-date information and challenge all the negative stuff that she'd read on the internet. Of course, we all know if you Google the condition, you, you read all sorts of things that are no longer true. They're very old research. Um, and I think the, the, the charity is very good at bringing you right up to date with, with information and research and medication. So she did notice that a lot of people in the room at these meetings that we went to were older than her and that her experiences were somewhat different. So after that, she, she kind of took on a bit more determination to live her life. Um, she went on a charity trip um, with a, a charity called Teams for You and spent a week in Romania with disadvantaged children. Um, she hosted a band night to raise money for the trip. Um, she actually played drums at the time <laughs> in a group. So that was, uh, that was quite good. Um, she, you know, she learned to drive. She went on holiday with her girlfriends. Went to where she was uh, high fived on the dance floor by a non English speaking gentleman. I remember her saying that he saw her scar, her, her pacemaker scar, and kind of lifted his shirt out the way to show her his, and high fived her on the dance floor. So that was, she thought that was really funny. Uh, so Jenny then decided she would like to be a key contact for young people through the charity and attended a training day. Um, obviously, we're in awe of her, but at the same time, the reality of her condition was all too clear to see. She was struggling with tolerating the blood pressure reducing meds and the beta blockers and would feel faint and see black spots quite a lot. Um, and obviously, as her parents, she's begging her not to, do, not to push herself too much. But she was very adamant that she would rather die young and enjoy living rather than be sitting on the sofa all day long feeling ill. So obviously, you know, as her parents, you find that hard to hear, but you know that she's got to live her own life. And I think that's the difficult thing with having a child with the condition is letting them take control of it and control their own lives. That's hard for us as parents to kind of let go and let her do that. Um, obviously, going to appointments, I always went with her and actually she always she always does say to me, even now, she's 27 and she'll say, mum, I've got an appointment, do you want to come? You know, Because she knows <laughs> that I would always want to go with her. Um, but again, we're talking about COVID, obviously that's not been possible recently, which, is, uh, which has been hard. Um, she, so this is sort of six, getting me to 18 now, Jenny's in the sixth form doing her A-levels. And she went to a pacemaker um, check at the hospital and they actually kind of, they print out a bit of a timeline and they can see what her heart function has been doing. And they kind of looked at, looked at this thing and sort of said to Jenny, you know, what were you doing on this particular day at this particular time? And she'd actually been at school and she remembered that she'd not felt very well and had said to the teacher, you know, can I go home? And she'd got in her car because she was then driving at 18 and drove home <laughs> and she'd gone to bed and, and it had been fine. But what had actually happened on that day is her heart had shook for about 12 seconds before writing itself and going back into her normal rhythm. And the doctors basically said, Jenny, you know, if that had gone on any longer, that would have been a sudden death situation. So you need an ICD fitting. So rather than just the straight pacemaker, she then had to have um, a device with the built-in ICD as well. Right in the middle of her A-levels, again, you know, you just think, this poor kid, she's not going to do anything, you know, um, the easy way. So she had to go um, and have this ICD fitted, which she really did not want. She'd spent the, the couple of years um, between having the pacemaker fitted and now, at this point, saying to everybody, I hope I never, ever need a defib because, you know, it frightened at the thought of it, you know, shocking her. And um, so, of course, it was, it was psychologically really difficult for her to accept that she needed an ICD. So after the, um, obviously, so they got her through her A-levels, school again, were very supportive. 
she actually got an A and two Bs, which enabled her to go to university, which she wanted to do psychology at Lancaster at the time, and wanted to prove to herself that she could live an independent life and uh, actually went and, and lived with an amazing bunch of girls who, once she'd sort of explained, you know, her heart condition, which I think for young people is always difficult to um, to kind of admit that, you you know, you might have problems, you might have issues. They, they were fabulous. And if she was having a, a bad day, as you all know, you can have good days and bad days. They wouldn't let her go shopping. They would, There was five flights of stairs to their, to their apartment, you know, um, no lift, but they wouldn't let her carry shopping. And they would make her sleep with her bedroom door open if she was feeling uh, poorly so that they could check on her. Um, really love those girls for that. They were, they were brilliant. But unfortunately, the good days were few and far between, and Jenny was suffering with frequent bouts of, of AF, atrial fibrillation. And she would convince herself that the ICD was going to fire and get herself into such a state. She'd ring us, and of course, we were here on the Wirral, and she was up there in Lancaster. So we would jump in the car late at night after this phone call, listening to her crying and sounding so frightened that she was about to get a shock. Um, We'd jump in the car, drive up the motorway to Lancaster and get there to find that the paramedics were there or, you know, she'd been taken to the local Lancaster hospital. Um, and, of course, they would they would wire her up to do an ECG and look at it and kind of panic because, obviously, when you've got a left bundle branch block, it's never going to look normal. Um, so, you know, there was always a bit of a, a panic about it all. Um I think if you don't go to a specialist hospital like Liverpool, it's always difficult for the doctors to, to know what to do, really. Um, so we begged her to come home, uh, you know, and she was in such a bad place and feeling broken. She'd had a couple of relationship breakups. I think, again, um, you know, I, I could see from the young lad's perspective, they, they were really young and, you know, I'm going out with somebody with a, a heart condition it was a worry and, it, you know, it was a difficult thing. So I kind of understood when they didn't stick around. But for Jenny, I think it was just very difficult to, to think, well, who who is going to want me? You know, will anybody ever want me? And it was it was a very rough time for her. Um, I think being 18 anyway is difficult, you know, with all the hormones and everything else. But um she just felt that she would never meet anybody that can handle her crap, as she called it, you know. Um, so we, we realised that the stress actually was causing the AF. I think that was the bottom line. And um, she needed to take control of, of her life. And um, her consultant at Liverpool had actually just done a master's degree in uh, cognitive behavioural therapy. So she tried a bit of that with Jenny, which was brilliant. Um it's Jenny being a psychology student, it was never going to work as well as you, you think it should because Jenny obviously knew all the, well, no, it's not that good actually, Mum, you know, but it, it, she did try and help her with, with the CBT. So in the end, Jenny did decide to come home for a break from her studies and then bravely decided to live back at home and continue a degree at a local university in Chester. So that that obviously made Mark and I feel a lot lots better that she was under our roof. Um, she joined a local gym and started Tai Chi and yoga classes, and she was really feeling you know better in herself about um, you know having beaten herself up because she'd failed to finish this degree. Um, you know, I think it was just that was a very difficult time. They actually started her on um, an SSRI drug to boost her serotonin hormone. Um, I think it's sertraline, it's called. I don't know that lots of people might might be on that. Um, but the AF actually stopped, which was which was brilliant, and we could all breathe again, and we had Jenny back again. So now she was feeling better and back in control. She quickly reverted to trying to help others, and she had time to kill before her course started in Chester. So with her own personal journey and psychology background, she started helping Dr. Rao at Liverpool collect letters from patients to support more funding for psychological support at Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital. If you can just do the next slide. She actually attended the House of Commons. There's some pictures there. 
and representing uh, again the cardiomyopathy association that, that as it was called then and talked to MPs about not failing on heart failure and she also spoke to a large group of ICD patients for Dr Rao at Aintree Racecourse about her experiences these patients were all about to have an ICD fitted um, and Jenny was able to talk to them and then she did something that took us all by surprise and filled uh, Mark and I, her dad and I, with dread and actually asked for her ICD to be turned off. Um, she just felt that she didn't need it. Uh, the fear of it firing was, was still stopping her living her life to the full. Um, and, you know, obviously we, from our perspective, we were saying, well, you know, what if you need it? What if, you know, you something happens and, you, you know, we lose you, you die and we're going to think, you know, well, you know, we, we've turned it off. And she said, well, you're not turning it off, mum. You know, it, I'm turning it off. It's my decision, my life. Um, and obviously that's what she wanted to do. So having spoken to Dr Rao, fully expecting her to say no, she, <laughs> she actually said, well, you know, it hasn't fired. You haven't needed it. We'll keep it in, but just switch it off. But it'll be able, we'll be able to switch it back on if you need it. So that's what we did for a little while and actually found that her um, uh, EF uh, was now 38, which was sort of double what it had been at, at uh, pacemaker implant. So taking into account the fact that it had actually never fired, she agreed to turn it off. But when she needed a replacement, they decided to fit just the pacemaker. So she no longer has an ICD now. She just has the pacemaker with the third wire. Um, and her EF is now above 40. So um, the only problem Jenny's had with the pacemaker is a wire uh, fault. Um, and then when they tried to replace the wire, they couldn't actually get the wire out because it was stuck. I think things kind of must grow over, tissue must grow over uh, the leads inside and they couldn't actually get it out. So they managed to get a replacement wire in through a, a, another vein. So she now has four wires, one of which isn't working. So that's where we were at that point. Um, so I think, as I say, the most difficult thing having Jenny as a daughter, uh, you know, is letting her have the control and make the decisions as she grows older. And obviously, you know, when your children are tiny, you can make their little worlds perfect. You can solve all their problems. And I think the hardest thing for us is not being able to fix um, fix problems for her. Um, and that's a constant battle for both of us, I think, is not being able to, to take things away for her. Um, you know, we, we worry about her future still, but actually um, she's currently doing a PhD at Liverpool University. And that was through uh, really Joel at the, at the, at the Cardiomyopathy UK, speaking to a, a lecturer there who had had funding to do some research um, into the psychological effects of, of a, a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy and had spoken to Joel. And Joel, obviously, knowing Jenny, had done her psychology degree. Um, so, well, I might know somebody, but, you know, she hasn't done her master's yet. Not necessarily a problem. Send her to see us. And, uh, you know, it went from there, really. So that's what Jenny's been working on for the last three years now. She's almost finished. Um, but what happened when Jenny came home from Lancaster was that she went to a local pub with her sister and met... Mark, <laughs> another Mark, and they are now actually married. So all those worries about who was going to love her and who was going to have her and, you know, uh, went out the window. So that's brilliant. Um, we, if you just put, pop the next slide on, these are some of the things that we do with the support group. Um, you can see different speakers there that we have. Um, the 3D model of a heart print, uh, printed model there in the middle of, uh, of the picture that was Rob Cooper came and gave a talk to us from Liverpool and they do three printed models of hearts before they do surgery you know if you've got hypertrophic specifically and they need to do uh, a myectomy or a, an alcohol ablation they they do these 3D printed hearts so that was that was fabulous to see and if you pop the next slide on we've got um 
lots of things that we do as a family fundraising. I think having Jenny with the condition has affected a lot of family members. Um, Ellie, uh, daughter number three, has done a skydive. Uh, we've had a friend do a wing walk there. Another friend runs marathons for us. Um, the bare-chested gentlemen all had their chests waxed, <laughs> bless them, for the charity. And mum there on the right-hand side down at the bottom, she makes cards and sells them for, for the charity as well. So, um, you know, we all try and, and do our bit, really, lots of cake sales and things. So, you know, that's... <sighs> I think to try and raise awareness, Jenny and I, Jenny's inspired me when she did her um, mentor training for young people. I, I sort of decided, well, I could do that for parents of young people. So I went along and did the training for that. And from there, we decided to, open, to do the support group um, initially for, just for the Wirral area. And then Rob Cooper at Liverpool actually asked if we could expand into Liverpool to cover that area as well. So it's now um, Cheshire and Merseyside support group. Um, obviously at this point, I'd like to thank uh, particularly Robert Hall and Ali Thompson for all their help with the support group um, and for supporting us as a family, always replying to frequent emails and phone calls and uh, making our desire for something positive to come out of the situation that we found ourselves in um, a reality really. And I think, that's been important for us to deal with the situation is to try and just do something with it. So obviously we couldn't be more proud of Jenny. She's, she's 27. Um, uh, yeah, you can pop the next slide up. You can see that's her wedding picture there. Um, Nate is Mark's son who is now eight. Um, so she was already mummy to him. And you can see by the picture on the right hand side, we have an eight week old new granddaughter. Jenny's just had a baby, which was, uh, again, something else that she thought she might never be able to do. Um, something else that Mark and I worried ourselves sick for nights on end, weeks on end about. But actually, um, she was very well monitored at Liverpool Women's Hospital by no other than Dr. Piat, who used to look after her at Older Hay when she was tiny. So... For him, that was amazing as well. And for us, that was very reassuring that he was looking after it. And her heart function did not falter. It's still 40 right the way through the pregnancy, uh, probably helped by the lockdown situation. She, she couldn't really do very much. She was in at home, just resting. Um, and everything seems fine. The baby seems fine. She's going to have a scan just to check the baby's heart. Um, but Jenny's, as far as we know, isn't a genetic condition. Um, there's nobody else that we can think in the family that has had it um, or has got it. And um, we're currently waiting for some information back. We, we joined the 100,000 Genome uh, Programme. So Mark and I and Jenny have all had our uh, DNA taken um, but there's, that was sort of kind of four years ago now, and I know things are taking a long time to um, to actually analyse the data that they're getting. But um, as far as we know, there's nothing. There's nothing sort of genetic. Jenny just calls herself a mutant. She she was just the mutant that got it when she was born. Um, so yeah, just to end on a high note, really, I think, and and to give hope to other people. Um, that have little ones with the condition. Um, I think we've been very lucky that it was found and diagnosed and treatment started before any damage was ever done to our heart. I know a lot of children um, suffer, you know, heart attacks and things before they even find they've got the condition. Um, so, yeah, we feel very, very privileged, very lucky and just very proud of Jenny. So, yeah, thank you. So we've got we have got some questions. Can you see them, Alison? I can. Um, thank you for sharing that and that story. That picture at the end is lovely. Um, <laughs> it's certainly been a journey. It really has. Yeah. yeah it really yeah. has. Um, um, right. Yeah. I've got. We've also had some questions come in while we were talking as well. Um, but one thing else before I answer those or ask them between ourselves. What sort of how have you coped at those times when you know different news has been given to you or you know the ups and downs? 
Well, I think probably like yourself, I think family have been a massive support. Um, sometimes you don't cope, do you? You have days where you don't cope very well and there's been lots of tears shed, as you can imagine. But I think as a family, we do tend to talk a lot. Um, Jenny particularly will tell me, you know, ins and outs of everything. You know, sometimes, you know, you just think, OK, <laughs> you know, too much information. But, yeah, Jenny's very good at, at, um, at talking herself, and I think that's helped Mark and I, obviously, to, to know exactly where she is and to, to know how to help her. But, but yeah, mm. it, it is. it has been, and we've got three other daughters, obviously, um, as well. So um, I've got another daughter that's actually got Crohn's and colitis, so that, that's a whole other... A whole other story um, <laughs> of, of things to cope with, but um, no, I think as a family we're very good at, um, at at talking. I think that's that's the important thing. Yeah, yeah. staying staying positive. Yeah, Mark's um, been a diabetic since he was a teenager, so I think he's he's got a really good grip on living with long term conditions. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Not, not right. like your husband <laughs> saying, not letting it rule you. You know, you like, yeah. you, you control it, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah. talking definitely, um, and talking yeah. to wider family. Um, I know. I mean, we've got uh, there's another sibling in Martin's family. He doesn't want to be tested. Yeah. Um, and he doesn't want his children to be tested. Um, where we obviously, you know, always had it and always. But they and I'm just like it's a ticking time bomb. I didn't. Yeah. Want yeah. to worry about that. Um. So we've always been open about it, but yeah, yeah. it's difficult. It's yeah, difficult. yeah. One of the questions that's come through for you, or there's two actually come through for you. So, okay. what was the um, single most significant event in your family's life regarding Jenny's condition? Wow, I think actually that moment when I found out that she wasn't gonna, it was something she wasn't gonna grow out of. I think for me, that I remember that that was earth shifting that day. I think I nearly fainted. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think. What do you think, Mark? Um, Sorry, my husband's here. I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> listening in in the background. Uh, I think I think it's it's shock when you you're dealing with shock in any form, and I think lots of people who get this diagnosis as well you go into a bit of a shock mode yeah. to start with. And what we found most helpful was to gather as much and learn as much information as we could about it. Mm. Not that we become experts at all, but we could at least have um, a reasonable dialogue with the clinicians and doctors. And whenever they mentioned, you know, a three-letter acronym or what have you, or a word, we didn't understand. We said, well, what's that? You know, mm -hmm. and uh, I think if you keep asking questions and get yourself as much info as you can, because, um, you know, lots of things are common sense, actually. Uh, mm. And we found that a source of, uh, source of comfort. And, of course, cardiomyopathy have been, um, you know, a, a well, have a wealth of knowledge. And uh, I, you, I certainly recommend anybody who's worrying about it, worrying about the future or what's going to happen to them or their, their siblings or their loved ones to, to go along with them. Or, or even go without them um, to find out. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of people that come to our support group on their own, like their their, their husband, their wife, their, whoever it is that's got the condition, don't want to come. A bit like your husband, it's not really for them, but they 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 still come for themselves for their own, you know, to ask their own questions and to talk mm -hmm. to other people that that understand. So a bit like yourself, Alison. Yeah, you, know, you, you want to know for yourself, don't you? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think a significant event for me, I mean, obviously, it was pretty life-changing when we were told Martin had the condition, but whether it's because I was 21 and a little bit more resilient at that time or didn't have many other commitments, um, when our youngest, he was um, just over one, um, we were caught, Martin had his usual, um, he had a 24-hour tape and his usual checks, he was just on beta blockers at that point and they called and said oh can you come in and discuss we're going to think we might need to change your medicine so I went with him thought you know another day in London just literally thinking they were going to talk about changing a prescription and they said oh we spotted something on your 24-hour tape were you ill were you not right you know it was quite a dangerous reading and we were unaware of it it happened early hours and they said oh we've got to get a 
an ICD fitted into you really urgently, like wow. the risk has gone yeah. up. And it's I yeah. think the thought then, I thought if we didn't have had that, hadn't had that call, I would have been like a widow with two son, small children. Yeah. And I yeah. think that for me was probably more significant than the initial diagnosis. Yeah. 10, yeah. 10 years before that. Yeah, yeah, probably that as well, along with the initial finding out that, it, you know, she wasn't going to get better. Probably the other significant event was that yeah. when Jen had yeah. to have an ICD fitted. So there's yeah. a question here for you, Alison. What would you want to see change for your husband in terms of support services or treatment? Um, as far as his current treatment, I mean, it, it's really all quite under control. He's obviously got the ICD. He's on his third one. Um it's changed so much since he had his first one because now we have the monitoring under the under the bed so we don't have to have so many trips up to London to check and things like that. So that has improved things. I don't I suppose longer term, I don't know how many more ICD changes can happen because obviously that you know how many how much more room there is with there's muscle scarring, whether in the future there'll be, you know, almost rechargeable things. So you don't have to have that intrusion of going into hospital and recovery time. So treatment-wise, that um, would be lovely to look forward to. Um, there's an ongoing discussion about warfarin, um, and it was good to hear Professor Elliot this morning talk about that, if anyone was in the Hocum um, chat this morning. Um, he's, Martin's very resistant to take warfarin. Um, he's petrified of needles, although I now understand you don't have to have it injected. There's tablet forms. Um, but when, that's a obviously going to be much more life-changing with diet and things like that so but obviously you've got that's got to be outweighed with the risk of stroke so I think there I think are some probably... new newer blood thinners aren't there that don't yeah. aren't affected so much by your diet so maybe they'd be better for him yeah I think it's just again those old horror stories when you hear you know or you've read something from years ago like about warfarin um yeah but so that's obviously something we'll be challenged with I know at some point um yeah but yeah, so treatment-wise, with what he's getting, it all seems it's all under control and really good, um, and it's not it's not too invasive. Um, yeah, yeah that's, um, there's also a question, another one coming for you, Julie. Um, so, what training did you do, if any, to offer psychological support? I'm presuming that's within your so. Um, support group I don't know if yeah the, the, when, when I when I decided to be a key contact as they were then called for uh, parents of or carers of uh, people with the condition the charity ran um, a, a day's sort of training that we went along to along with other people that were that were wanting to do the same thing um, and they it was just a day's training to be to be fair that's that's the only training I've ever had um, but it was just led by, you know, sort of like role play situations and things like that. Um, but I think I've not had any, obviously, proper psychological training as such. Um, yeah. But I think just just sharing your experiences really with, with yeah. other people. University of Life. Yeah, the University of Life. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, we're all qualified in that. <laughs> yeah, but I would never, obviously, I would never, ever give anybody medical advice or yeah. suggest any form of medication or treatment change without, um, obviously, just referring them back to their own specialist. I think that's the important thing. Um, I, know, I know you said you tried going to a support group. Would you go on your own without your husband if you felt you needed uh, to speak to others? I think I would, and um, I have looked at, looked into it because we have got one now in Kent. Um, sometimes it clashes with their things. Um, yeah. and I'm on their forum on on Facebook as well. They've got their own page. Yes, yeah. Um, so it, yeah, it's not that I won't. Um, I just haven't as yet. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, think, I know a lot. We've got a lot of people that that come along find it useful. So yeah. And, for yourself, what do you do, or both of you do, sort of to look after yourself for all those times when you know? I know you're a busy mum anyway. Um, yeah. But what do you do to yourself? Um, well, probably a bit more recently because we've both retired now in the last twelve months, so it's quite nice. Um, we have a bit more time to do things that we want to do and, and do things together. Um, but yeah, growing while they were all growing up, it was difficult to do anything really that was. Um, taking yourself out of the situation and, and giving yourself that, that time. Um, 
I don't know, really. I don't think I ever did. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we were just... I think we... we I think we... It's, it's very easy to lose perspective um, about a lot of things. So... Um, one of the things that we've always tried to do is to keep some sort of perspective. There's already so, always somebody else. I remember somebody saying to me once when I was diagnosed diabetic, uh, who's worse off than you? And you hear the horror stories of other people who've got things far worse than you've got or your daughter's got or what have you. And that people have died and they've lost them. Um, so you, you kind of can, can dwell on one side of the line or the other. Um, and we choose to, do, to dwell on the side of, of the positive without sort of sticking your head in the ground and forgetting all the other things, mm. but to concentrate on, on that side and, yeah. you know, what will improve things, what will make things better. And when you're, you're not dealing with your own psychology either, you're also yeah. dealing with, the, with, in our case, Jenny's and yeah. uh, our other daughters with, uh, with you know everybody's everybody's got problems yeah it's just a matter of how you deal with them not whether you're going to have them and uh, yeah. so we've always kept that kind of positive outlook and perspective if you like so um, you can say i've got my own personal yoda here who who's like you know <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's very good at uh, settling everybody down and saying, well, let's just look at this a different way. But I think um, I think just keeping busy and doing something positive with it, that's always been my drive, yeah. really, not to not to sit and feel sorry for ourselves, but actually what can we do with this? We can, we can perhaps help other people in the same situation or, um, mm. you know, and, and to be fair, Jenny's, Jenny's led a lot of that, you know, just in the way she is herself. Um, yeah. I mean, it's at high school, half the teachers and most of her friends didn't even know she had a heart condition. It wasn't something <laughs> she ever sort of advertised or played on or, you know. Um, yeah, and just, uh, I'm, I mean, we're proud of all our girls. Our eldest daughter is actually a paediatric nurse and that was because she grew up with Jenny in and out of Alder Hay Hospital and she just grew up saying, I'm going to be a nurse, I'm going to be a children's nurse. And that, that was very focused all the way through. And actually she, she is now... Um, that's what she does. That's her sure. job. So, um, mm. Ellie, the, the the girl with the Crohn's and colitis, unfortunately, grew up with a needle phobia. Um, so she's had all that to deal with because obviously now, currently, she's on infusions and things every few weeks. And but she's had a lot to deal with. Um, I think that I think they have all been affected by Jenny having the condition in different ways. But they they are all very aware of other people's sort of conditions and. Um, you know, they're very, what's the word, when they're, they, just, they, they pick up things from empathetic. people, emp empathetic, yeah, yeah. they're very, um, very good at that, at that, and I think that's, you know, due to having Jenny with her heart condition, definitely. Um, it just changes you, doesn't it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Changes your yeah. perspective on things, so. Yeah, no, this yep. def definitely changes things, but I wouldn't want to change any of them for anything else. Um, no. So, and then what advice would you give to others? I mean, obviously, you talked about talking and up and oh. finding out information, but is there anything else? Yeah, I think just don't go on Google. Don't Google anything. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to go on Google, look at obviously the Cardio Market UK site yeah. or British Heart Foundation. Um, just get some up to date, accurate information because we have so many people that come along to the support group just thinking, well, I'm going to die. But yeah. Google says I'm going to die within, you know, four years of diagnosis or whatever it is that comes up before, as soon as you put cardiomyopathy in. Yeah. Um, and it's just not, it's, that's not the case anymore. You know, maybe it was once upon a time, but I think with my medication and devices and, and all the technology, um, I mean, the beta blockers that Jenny's on weren't available when she was born even. You know, that was a brand right. new drug when she was 14. So, um you know, there's, they're moving on all the time. There's new meds all the time. Things change. Um, yeah, it's interesting because yeah, Martin's yeah. on the same ones. It's the right. Because I know some people, it takes a while to get the right one and they get yeah. lots of side effects. He's been on the same one from day one. Yeah, Jenny mm -hmm. had a, a really bad cough on Captopril. We had to change her from Captopril when she was probably, I don't know how old, but mm, when she was like, still little, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, there are there are different meds you can try. Um, 
yeah, it's, it's just just get some knowledge, I think. Take control and, um, you know, be in control. I mean, the gen they used to try and uptitrate Jenny's blood pressure meds. And she just couldn't tolerate it. She would just stand up and fall over. And she said, you know, I'm a young person. If I was in my 80s, yeah, I'd be quite happy to sit on the sofa all day. But yeah, yeah. I actually want to live my life. So can we stop? You know, and she really had to push. And they agreed in the end to just leave her on a very small amount. Yeah. And, you know, that, I think that it's important to, to, to give that information back to the doctors. Really talk to your doctors and let them know how it's impacting your life and, and try yeah. and find the right medication. And the right the right dose you know for you to live your life so yeah 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 so did, How, did oh, sorry go on sorry no you go <laughs> i was gonna say did you did you find the cardiomyopathy uk sort of uh quickly or did it take you a while to find somewhere to go for advice and um it took Probably about, yeah, because obviously I didn't have a home computer. We didn't have. In, ah, right. in, 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 uh, like when we're talking sort of 1990. Yeah. Um, and it was just then a second-hand computer that was given to us so I could do some college work. Right. Um, well, it was 1992, actually. So that's when I started looking. And I actually found, apart from all the horror stories, information for the one in America, the charity right. in America. And yeah. then, but that had a link back to here, to England um, or to the UK. So that's when I found... Cardiomyopathy Association right. and spoke to Robert quite a bit on the like, helpline. Yeah. So that's that's what we used. Um, and they, they've just been invaluable, um, really invaluable with just solid information, just either that I could take with that knowledge to the hospitals, particularly with children yeah. Um, yeah. when we were going for their checkups at Great Ormond Street. Yeah. Um, and it was good that our records were linked. So, you know, Professor McKenna went, did both clinics. Um, yes, yeah. And it's, I mean, looking back, with, there used to be a clinic once every week or once one Tuesday every six weeks, and they're now running weekly. So, the, you know, how it's changed since having the children. Um, but, yeah, the nurses were just all, had so much information to give. Um, but, yeah, I suppose, yeah, just link taking the information from the, the charity was really really useful um, yeah good yeah whilst we'd still be at guys and martin probably be, still be sitting in a sort of elderly heart failure clinic um, yes yeah and not and like i said none of his treatment was bad or anything like that but we just didn't have the answers um, yeah you know so good yeah good i don't know oh, if we're gonna get there. any more questions i have no, it doesn't look like it. Doesn't like got... it. We can wrap it up there, I think. Um, yeah, we've got better. No, thanks for sharing minutes. your story. It's been really interesting to hear, you know, different different slant on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah and and yours. Good to hear from both of you.